Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of Disability Awareness Week 2021. Uh, my name is Peter Santiago, and I'm the Associate Director of Accessibility Services. We're the office on campus that supports uh, individuals with disabilities at the college. So captioning, as you can see, is enabled for this session, and you can download a transcript at the end of the session if you'd like. Um, I'm joining you today from land that was stolen and rightfully belongs to the Lenape people. And it is my sincere hope that there is some way that as a society, uh, we can find a way to make amends to the generations of indigenous peoples that have been forcibly removed from these lands and worse. Um, this year for Disability Awareness Week, uh, we've chosen to celebrate the whole person and the myriad of intersection, intersecting identities that are often overlooked uh, when describing people with disabilities. We have panels, talks, and screenings scheduled, um, all presented by KCC faculty, staff, and students. And we have one off-campus uh, featured speaker that's going to be talking to us about intersectionality and disability through the lens of racism, transphobia, homophobia, and other, other marginalized identities and disability. So this, uh, this event is gonna be moderated by my colleague, Sue Carpenter, and includes a lovely group of people from across campus and alumni, students, Melissa Riggio participants, and uh, take it away, Sue. Thank, thank you, Peter. And thank you everybody for coming. And uh, if you would like to just put uh, hello in the chat and how you came to come to the session this afternoon, that'd be great. So yeah, I'm gonna facilitate the discussion. And we have Margot Cole, Professor Thompson, Professor Mintz, Michael Letman and Kensaku Matsuda, you might like to uh, come in at certain points. Um, so I will ask people to introduce themselves and I will start with Margo Cole. Okay, I'm a Kingsborough alumni. I graduated in 2018. I am a filmmaker who makes uh, films about uh, disability awareness, and I'm also on the board of Teatro Paraguas Theater, which is a bilingual theater based out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Thank you. And next on my screen here is Professor Keisha Thompson. Hi, I'm Professor Keisha Thompson. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Behavioral Sciences Department. I taught Margot in Psych 11 a couple of years ago. Thanks. Uh, Kensaka, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Kensaka Matsuda. I'm a, a program director for the Melissa Original Higher Education Program, uh, which is a, an inclusive higher education program uh, established in partnership between AHRC in New York City and um, each uh, several coll CUNY colleges throughout the New York City boroughs. Um, hopefully, I uh, hope to kind of learn something from the panelists today and also chime in a little bit wherever, wherever I'm needed. Thanks. And next on my screen is Professor Tommy Mintz. Hi, I'm Assistant Professor of Photography, Tommy Mintz. I'm in the art department here at Kingsborough Community College. I've had a number of students from the Reggio program in my classes, uh, digital photography, and also in photography club. Um, and I hope to share some of those experiences today. And Michael, Michael Letman, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Letman. I'm, cur I'm currently in my third year from attending the Melissa Regio Higher Education Program. And despite recent, and despite many remote semesters that I ended up having in my college program, I mean my college life, life, I'm still doing all right, even though by the time I finish this college program, that's it, no more college life. I'll get, I'll get over it, I hope. And, and final comment. And currently struggle, currently struggling with me classes, but doing okay, I guess. That's all I can say for now. Thank you, Michael. And my name's Professor Sue Carpenter. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences in the education program. And I have had the pleasure and honor of um, integrating, including students 
um, in the Melissa Regio now for I think probably eight years, um, including Michael. So um, without further ado, I am going to pose the first question. And so the title of this session is um, Students and Faculty Share Stories of Success, Frustration and Fun. So I think we'll start with success first. And uh, Tommy, you're first on my list. Um, thank you, Sue. I think uh, a success that um, has happened many times in my photo class with um, Reggio students is the amount of enthusiasm and interest that Reggio students um, share with other students in the class. Uh, and, and that really sets a great tone for the class and um, opens up class discussions in a wonderful way. Great, thank you. And just to clarify what Kanzaka already mentioned that the Melissa Riggio program is a program for students with intellectual disabilities to contribute and be part of the college community. They audit classes as well as have their own courses in independence and life skills and also integrate into clubs such as Tommy Runs. Okay, Michael, a success story, please. Yeah, a success story. Oh, Professor Carpenter. Well, despite, well, despite I'm honored to be here for Autism Awareness Month, I don't really, not really sure about a success story I can think of. All I can say is this. During my, during my first year, while well, I was doing all right, right, yeah, I feel like I was doing okay, struggling with my classes, yeah, but I know I had the mentors at my side, right, to help me get through tough assignments. And, yeah, despite no, uh, a lot of in-person activity, a lot of in-person activity taken away from me by the pandemic, during the KCC remote classes only, I appreciate the help from the mentors. And, it's un and it was unsuccessful that I couldn't be in one of your classes in person. Sorry to say that. But it was still successful to pass your remote assignments. And, it's, and I'm not feeling any successful story during my third college year, unfortunately. Str mm -hmm. A lot struggling. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, oh, wait, Marco oh, oh, wait, I, oh, wait, I just realized something. I, oh, wait, I just realized something. Um, this is just a this is from my perspective about a successful story. Students in the college program uh, and ought to do better with their assignments if they were to somehow gain one of the gain one of the classes that you know are of their interests. Because I know this, someone like oh, if someone likes a photography, they'd be happy to be in Professor Min's class. <laughs> I know that. And 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 that also and there's two of my classmates who are into fashion and stuff. They got a class. They no, they showed again a class for that. Oh yeah, and one of my new classmates, he likes Spanish, so he got into, so he got into a Spanish class. Oh, good. Of course. Good. Of course. I'm, I'm glad I'm sure they, they do. Their, I'm sure they do good in those classes as their as part of their interests. That that sounds great. I'm glad students got what what they opted for. What their choice was. Um, okay, Professor Thompson, okay. success story. Um. I mean, Marco's here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dear. <laughs> um, but I think it's it's always a joy when um, we can sort of work through the challenges together. Um, I think one thing that I learned from Peter was like, it's not my job to find a solution, um, but to you know be a part of that process with the student. So I think that's always great when I can sort of be a part of that, but not be the solution per se, um, because that really promotes independence in our students. And I know it feels really good when you figure something out on your own. Um, one of my favorite days ever in the whole year is graduation day. Um, and so like, I remember walking down the aisle and seeing Margo in her cap and gown. And, and that's, all, that's always like just a great feeling for me. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I would say that for me, uh, Professor Thompson's class was uh, very successful. She was one of the first professors that I had in 2015. So I was still getting used to how do I communicate my accommodation needs? How are the professors going to react to me? And I felt that uh, it, you know, Thompson was very approachable as far as like, you know, I need this because uh, I remember distinctly she had sort of a portion of the class that involved a public speaking thing as a group. So I wasn't sure kind of how to do that with my mobility. And we kind of talked it through with my team members and Professor Thompson, and it turned out to be a very successful presentation where I was also able to mention some of my film work. And when Thompson saw that, she actually recommended me to the diversity festival at Kingsborough. And that kind of started this, you know, thing that I've been doing with you, Sue, and a lot of these professors where I public speak on disability, where I had never pictured myself doing that. So uh, Thompson, you were a big inspiration for me to start uh, doing more advocacy work in that way where I had never thought of doing that before. And it was uh, so nice after coming out of the public school system where I kind of felt like the teachers sort of saw me as a dollar sign instead of a, a student that could contribute. It was nice having a professor that saw who I really was as a person, uh, as this filmmaker and this uh, student that was very interested in, you know, the different uh, disorders that you were talking about, like bipolar disorder and all this stuff. And now I have uh, friends with those conditions. And because I took your class first, I had some background on how their conditions worked and I'm able to help them and accommodate them as well, which has been really nice. So thank you. Great. Great. <laughs> so thank you, Professor Thompson. I hadn't realized it all stemmed from you. Yeah, inadvertently. Right, right. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right, Margo, do you have a question for me? <laughs> what was successful in your classes, Sue, with your lovely students? Oh. <laughs> well, um, Margo, you got Professor Susan Carpenter's classes? Oh, I've only public spoken for them. I've only uh, wanted to be in her class, but I'm uh, aged out of being in her class, unless she lets me audit them, which I'm okay with. That's that not <laughs> what I'm Margo. You attended oh, I'm, 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 I'm an alumni, so I already I, I took the classes. You, You're taking it now. Yeah. I mean, I hear you, bud. What well, before we went to alumni? I mean, you had many classes. I mean, you got into a psychology class with Professor Thompson, right? So why didn't you get? Yeah, into but I, I'm I'm in a different major than uh, Sue is in. I was in liberal arts. I wasn't in education, so I never met any of the education professors until I started public speaking, uh, and then I got to meet all the people from the different departments, which has been but from a the different subjects. Lesson. All right, okay, you should. Okay, it's a part of your major. You stick. Uh, that's I got into a psychology class, but you yeah. never got to really shot education. Did you? Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't. I would have loved to, but I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> you didn't know the option that you get to learn about children. Okay. Oh, I love children. I've I've uh, volunteered with children with autism before meeting you, and I that, that, it. Uh, then you got more luckier than I did, Margo. You're good. I'm done. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I think Margo's no a natural educator, a natural teacher, whatever her subject. Oh, well, yeah, you. my success story, I have a couple. Um, one was I presented at a conference in, at Syracuse University on inclusivity. And we had an honor student who came along, but we also had a Melissa Riggio student present with us. And Stella Woodruff, Director of Accessibility came. And it was truly an inclusive panel. And um, I don't know if any of you know this phrase, and perhaps Peter, you could write this in the chat for us. That's the phrase, um, nothing about us without us. And so that was certainly the case when Autumn Hester came with us to Syracuse. All right, um, what else, what else? So the next question is, what was frustrating? We come across challenges in our careers and in our studies often. And so I asked the question, what was challenging and um, was there a resolve to that challenge? All right, so we start with uh, Tommy again. So this is a harder question for me to answer. Uh, I think um, some of the challenges are kind of it's it's funny because it's 
hand in hand with the success that I was um, just talking about is how to um, really make sure that the conversations that are um, started, are, you know, continue and and are, you know, um, constructive for for all participants. Um, and I think that's always an interesting challenge, and especially when we have different. Um, uh, patterns of speech that you know we're sort of um, getting used to, or or all sorts of different um, uh, communication methods that I think you know uh, are challenging, and and uh, that's not a negative in a way. <laughs> it's funny to say. Um, and so, do you think you've kind of learned to? Uh, understand or be patient or just got used to different exactly. people's ways of communicating all three yeah I think um, patience might be number one you know and just sort of letting everybody have time to talk through complex ideas in language that uh, comes most naturally uh, especially in the arts where we are trying to you know put into words uh, images you know talk about things that we're looking at and and i think that's always a challenge you know, no matter what level people are entering you know dialogues in um as far as vocabulary or um the past experience speaking uh publicly you know in a classroom situation and I, you know it really is about patience um and, and listening yeah i agree um but it's a challenge always and i think it's a good challenge for, for me as a teacher yeah i appreciate it I, I know from my own experience, I had a student from the Melissa Riggio program with a speech impediment. And, uh, you know, we had to really listen and, and be patient and just let him speak at his own pace, not put any pressure on him. And boy, was it worth waiting for. He always had amazing insights and, um, and humor. And yeah, so yeah, interesting. Okay, so we hand over to a student now, uh, Margot. Okay, so um, the thing, if I can be honest, that was a little bit frustrating for me is that the public speaking was actually done in a group, and I tend to really hate uh, group projects because if somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do, I feel like my grade is going to end up being bad, and that just creates a lot of anxiety academically for me. Uh, luckily, you know, the eventual so, like sort of solution to this was I, I got to know the um, team members pretty well, and we did communicate uh, through email and uh, also met up in person quite a few times and, and like got our act together. But it was like really hard at first, like, is this person going to answer me? Are they actually going to do the part of the PowerPoint that they're supposed to do? And if they don't, is it going to be blamed on me? And so I, I mm. you know, and I, you know, when you're a disabled student, you always wonder, are they thinking, can the disabled student like do that? And, and are, are they going to put extra pressure on you? Luckily, these uh, students didn't. And I still have a friendship with them uh, mm -hmm. years later. But, you know, you never know. Mm -hmm. So that was tricky. <laughs> OK, interesting. So it was really to do with the structure of the course and working with your peers rather than anything a faculty member did or didn't do. Yeah, yeah it wasn't really like a social difficulty either. I, I love being social, but if they're not being uh, responsible and receptive to you communicating with them, it's like a dead end and it's really frustrating. <laughs> uh, Professor Thompson, back to faculty. Yeah, so that was my class that Margaret was talking about. I, I think all students just, just hate the group presentation for varying reasons. I think um, one of the challenge what challenges was that so Margot like physically like she has her crutches and I think you had a class like over in the Mac building and you mm -hmm. would come over to the clusters and so um, she did have a conversation with me in the beginning, like I may get here a little bit late. So I found myself trying to pace myself so she wouldn't miss too much in the beginning of class um, and trying to be mindful of that. But also like Margot is fiercely independent and just very determined. And so a lot of times when folks see her sort of coming with their crutches, they like run to her to try to help her. And she, I, I came to realize that she hated that because she wants to figure out how to make her own space and, and where to sit and to just like get herself. And so I think um, being able to model that for the students and then 
also being patient with my other students to realize like, hey, let her be, like she's gonna figure it out. I think that happens a lot of times in other classes as well with the communication issue. I think initially students are not sure, like why is this person communicating this way? Why do we have to wait so long for them to get a sentence out? And so again, it's about modeling and me being exercising that patience that Tommy talked about so that after a while, I just find that our students become so fiercely protective of their classmates. Um, and Margo is just like a leader, right? So I feel like she just took over that group. She was very sort of shy in the beginning. And she's like, I don't know about speaking in public. And that's another challenge, right? Like a lot of, like I'm thinking from a very ableist lens, like it's okay, you just get up and you speak. But she's like, I'm not sure because these are sort of like my limitations. And so it's finding that balance between pushing her a little bit outside of her comfort zone, but also not dismissing her real concerns. Um, and she was, I mean, you, you guys have seen her over the years. She's a rock star, so. Yeah, thanks to your class, I actually got very used to doing that and also realizing that in certain situations, I can't stand up and do it because if I stand up and public speak, all the tension goes up into my mouth instead of into the lower body. So I have to moderate mm -hmm. that a little bit in myself. And I mm -hmm. would not have figured that out probably if it weren't for your class first. And then I go into speech 21 later on and like it's like, okay, I've done this before. I just have to communicate to that professor in the same way who is a uh, uh, you know, Melissa, who we, we all know. And, you know, so luckily I had the practice in your class first. Um, I'm just thinking that Peter might have some stories of frustration and resolve. I'm sure you hear. Oh, one stories. thing I wanted to add, yeah. you know, what she was saying about being patient. I remember there was one class where I was like pretty late because the other one had gone over. And then of course I have the classes in closer proximity, but I'm not that fast. And you were so sweet to me that day. It, we were like watching a movie or something. And you said, don't worry, you didn't miss too much of it. And I was like, thank you for your patience. Cause I felt so bad. I was missing part of the movie. And then you were like all chill about it. So I was like, phew. <laughs> right. yeah and I know you've had those issues in terms of choosing your college that you're going on to for your for your four-year degree yeah I um, actually have to move because they didn't have classes in closer proximity at the other college which led to severe physical pain and I said I am not doing this this hurts too much and, and I need to take care of my body first before anything else right good yeah, so Peter, um, I'm sure you hear both sides of maybe the same story. I wonder if you have anything to add. And then we'll go to yeah. Michael. <laughs> You're exactly right. Very often I'll hear, I will hear both sides because uh -huh. I'll hear from the student, I'll reach out to the faculty member and, you know, I'll, I'll get both sides of it. Um, but it's interesting that, that all of the panelists mentioned the same frustrations that I was going to talk about that I've heard from students. And mainly that's you know, one feeling infantilized at times by faculty members, or the other side of that feeling as if their concerns were not taken as valid concerns or minimized. Um, oh, you don't, you don't need that extra time. You seem, you seem intelligent. You, you'll be able to get through it in the, the allotted amount of time or, you know, these comments that I think that some people think are meant to be encouraging, but they're not really. They're, they're discounting the person's identity and and them knowing themselves, right? And the insights that they have about themselves. Um, I think through communication and working together, many faculty and students have, have done amazing work together. Uh, I could think of one frustration that turned into success was um, I was working with a, a blind student on campus and she was taking a math course. Um, now math is notoriously inaccessible to screen readers um, just because of you know, the way math is written. Um, so the, the professor called me to ask if there were any tools. I explained what tools there were, but those were a little bit too complicated for them to, to learn in the amount of time that they had. Um, so instead they spoke with the student and they came up with their own language. So this professor actually wrote these exams out, you know, into words in a language that the student would understand so that she could listen to them using her screen reader, you know, answer the questions and, you know, she, she did very well in that math class when in the past she was unable to do well in math because of these limitations, you know, with the technology. Um, so that was a great partnership. And uh, yeah. to be honest, I was kind of surprised that that happened, but I was very happy to hear the, you know, 
the story and you know to yeah. see how close they had become in in working together um i think that's yeah. that's one other thing that I, I think you know communication wise that that is frustrating for our students in that there will be times where a faculty member may have a concern or have have recognized something and they'll reach out to us instead of speaking to the student directly mm. um, right. of course i will encourage them why don't you speak to the student you know i they can tell you better than I can. Um, but I think there's, I, I can't explain what it is, um, mm -hmm. but that is definitely frustrating for students. Um, and for myself as well, um, because I wish that they, they could recognize that this person is capable of describing, you know, what their needs, wants, abilities, goals are, um, and they don't need anyone to, uh, to speak on their behalf related to those things. If I can add to that, Peter, I think from, you know, interacting with, uh, you know, a few faculty doing these presentations, what was expressed to me is we don't want to seem like we're prying and asking what the disability is when we ask what the accommodation should be. So we don't know, like, kind of where that point is where we might be crossing into, like, HIPAA and stuff. And we don't know how to ask that without sounding like an ableist, you know, bleep so if we don't know what to do and it seems safer to them to go to you because you kind of know that boundary whereas you know they, they're not sure right yeah no definitely and and my response usually to that is that the the label is not going to really give you any more information than than the student can mm -hmm. um because you know if you take cerebral palsy for for one example right and which is my disability this. yes exactly that there's such a broad spectrum of how that could affect a person that just knowing that label doesn't really tell you enough to, to fully support and, and, and teach uh, this person or, you know, meet their needs. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, for example, I'm not part of Melissa Riggio, but there are people with uh, CP who would, you know, have those intellectual needs as well, depending on where it hits in the brain. And, you know, I have friends with CP that are in wheelchairs, so it really varies a lot. I'm, I'm pretty mobile, but I still need uh, mobility aids. I know also people with CP where you cannot tell that they have it because it's just on one side or one limb is affected. So you would never really know unless they told you. Very I think also there's, there's, there needs to be clarity or, or faculty need to become more aware about self-disclosure. It was something that, came, that I came across some years ago and wasn't really aware of that, you know, when you're in school, you have an IEP and the, the teacher knows of your disability. But as an adult and in college, it is your, it is everybody's choice whether to disclose or not. So um, I think sometimes there are problems with a lack of information, maybe, or understanding from, from faculty. Yeah, because what I definitely had when I came in was I didn't know how that system worked either. And then Peter and Gail kind of, you know, showed me all the paperwork and like walked me through like, yeah, you're supposed to do this, this and this. You don't need to disclose the disability, but you do need to approach the professor about this particular document. And then right. I just found out, you know, from life that it's easier to just say I have cerebral palsy, therefore I need X, Y, Z thing. Because it just kind of puts an idea in the head, okay, this person has a little bit of a motor issue and a little bit of a balance issue. So I can't like expect you to do like things on the spur of the moment and stuff. Whereas if I just kind of leave it open-ended, like I need this and people, you know, if they're just seeing me standing still, they think, oh, she can like climb over that, she, you know, so it's better for me to be specific. I know a lot of other people feel that, like the opposite where they don't want to mention mm -hmm. the disability, but I just feel like if you add the context there, people get it in two seconds and you don't have to go through the emotional exhaustion of trying to explain it the long way. Uh, so I just like came up to Thompson okay. and I blurted it out. That's just my story. Yeah, and I usually, I'm like, you don't need to tell me. <laughs> don't tell <Right>. me. <laughs> tell me what you need. Right. right? And I think right. you certainly can ask students what they need without forcing them to disclose something. It's up to them. If you want to talk about it, like I remember a student, you know, what was on the spectrum and I could tell from, from, from the way he would communicate, but one day in class, he just said it all out loud to his classmates. But that was his choice, right? And I think faculty can 
still meet students' needs without even knowing the diagnosis. Because most folks don't even know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, what do you need right. from me as an individual? And what do you need to take place in this classroom? I think that's a simple question that anybody can ask. Right. By the way, um, uh, participants, please, uh, you know, feel free to write a question in the chat or raise your hand if you have a comment, please, you know, we'd like it to be interactive. Sorry, Peter. Oh, no, to, to follow up on Keisha's point, I, I was going to say, I mean, frankly, that's that's what you would do with any one of your students, right? Is ask them what they need. How could you teach them? What could you do differently? And, you know, it's uh, aside from... The accommodations, which are a separate thing, there's so much that can be done in a classroom um, for all of our students True. by just talking to them. True. Uh, Michael, back back to a student, uh, Michael Letman. Um, I know you've been extraordinarily frustrated not being on campus. Are, are there any other things that were frustrating for you? Um, in your classes or, or being part of the program? Mm -hmm. okay, that's that I can explain. Well, as Professor Carpenter already knows, who's, who's, because her because the subject she works in is part of my interest. Yeah, it's one of my career interests to work with kids. I, I kind of wanted to, you know, be in a cl in person class in that subject of early childhood education. I mean, I also. I mean, I also. I mean, I couldn't do the first year because you're now starting out. I understood that, so I could wait. But as we all, but as we all expected, the moment I finally got in, the pandemic happened. I did enjoy the remote classes, but I kind of still, I was still kind of frustrated. And I mean, the experiences that I've enjoyed, I, I uh, something my heart tells me I would enjoy it better if it was in person. I. So I'll never forget that. I'll never forget how I've been frustrated to attend, to finally get my subject only to attend it remotely. And then there's my current struggling right now. Uh, I only took on two remote classes just to get out in person, but I ended, uh, but I ended up giving in person a try because, you know, I've been locked in my home for quite some time. Right? And I've been terrified of the outside world. So the moment I finally did it, I now regret doing those remote classes, only one only one of them be, that I'm currently struggling with. Yeah, I've been going through some struggling because you know when there's tough assignments to do in a class, in a class that's not part of your interests, boy, it can really mess with you. One class I'm currently enjoying, the other class I wanna get out of it. No offense to Professor Park and the astronomy subject, I wanna get out of it. Not your thing, got it. Oh, interesting. Uh, right. Is it, you think it's the topic? I, I don't want to get too into it, but. Um... No, 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 I'll make it more specific. Any, 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 of those, any of that class assignments, too complicated for me to understand, not clearing. Right. Well, Michael, this is interesting because this is uh, something that I, I wanted to say about my frustrations is that um, the role of the mentor is really, really important. And I know Kenzako is here, so I have his ears. Um, so my frustration one semester was I had, actually, I think she was subbing. She wasn't the usual mentor for the student. And um, she sat and did her nails <laughs> in the music and movement workshop. Um, so, um, but ordinarily the mentors can really, really help you and hopefully support you and the faculty. So if they're in the Melissa, in the Melissa Regio program. Uh, and certainly when I've worked closely with some of the mentors and they've become my friends and um, we've spoken and say, you know, how best can we help? And it's been fantastic when I've worked with the mentors and they've more and more moved away from the student so they've just become part of the class and they, you know, you're not even aware that who they're mentoring or why, you know, what their job is. And in a sense, that is their job to just be included and participate and be a role model and not do their nails. Right. Kenzaku, Kenzaku but, do you want to? Yeah, go. I'm going to, I like to say this to the program director, Kenzaku. 
I want to apologize to your program director. I mean, I'm currently, right now, during my spring semester, third college year. Strong, strong. Part of me, it's, it's cut in half. Good half. I'm enjoying one, I'm enjoying one remote class in the travel and tourism subject. I'm doing okay in that class, mostly with Carla. She's an expertise in that subject. The other class, I already mentioned it in the astronomy subject. If all of, I could, why couldn't there be a possible chance I could at least get out of it? And I may, may be willing to give it up for an in-person class, hopefully Professor Carpenter's subject. But I know, that not, I know that's not possible. I know, I'm trying, I have to stick with the two classes I got. It, they're not in person, so it's assignment on Blackboard and stuff. Uh, but my current schedule right now is kind of tough. I had oh, I only come to I only come on campus for a few days, hey, because I'm so terrified of the outside world. Long story, sorry, but not and still not uh, not interacting with others much. Just focusing on getting through assignments. Just being honest on that. So as you already know, everyone, I'm kind of struggling with my college life at the moment, in person and remote. Well, I hope there's some resolve, Michael, and uh, we hope to meet you in person uh, before the spring is out. Um, Kenzaku, please I, add, add, yes, add to it. I'm so happy to chime in. Um, um, I so I I, yeah, I introduced myself earlier, way at the beginning. Um, I part of a team that um, that organizes a, a team of uh, mentors, uh, peer mentors, who are essentially. Uh, uh, college students or recent grads who are who support you know the, the young adults who come to our program with intellectual developmental disabilities uh, through their college lives and and uh, in the case in this case Michael happens to be one of those people who are in our program but um, now I want to give Michael a lot of credit here um, there are a lot of people who come through our program especially when the pandemic hit us who were. Uh, in a lot of ways, frozen in their tracks, so to speak, when um, so uh, kind of nervous and anxious about the elevating crime rate, uh, hate crimes across the city, uh, the pandemic, of course, of while you know the the <laughs> I'm getting a huge thumbs up from Michael uh, because he can relate. I think he can relate to this 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 kind of sentiment and and. So, so of course, there's the, the fear component and the anxiety component of, of what a lot of students in the program had to go through. And, but at the same time, now there's the online or distance learning model that we now had to all become accustomed to, which was obviously a huge um, adjustment for anybody, regardless of whether you were ha uh, happen to have a dis uh, disability or not. But uh, in a lot of ways, and it, this was quite the challenge for us. And Michael, who, and I say earlier, Michael, I, Michael deserves a lot of credit because, you know, for a, quite a while, if you don't mind me sharing, Michael, you, you had a, a lot of uh, reservations about stepping foot outside your home and, and, and coming to campus or, or doing really much of anything with us in person. And after the spring semester started um, back in March, um, you with the you know with the support of some of our staff um and actually uh, uh one of your peers as well mustered up the courage to step out step foot outside of your home and um now you're on a regular basis you're coming to campus and um you know they can see that kind of transportation transformation take place um you know, it's something. I just, I just, it's just something that it reminded me that I can't take something like this for granted. You know, it's you know, sure I, I step outside and I can do all this and that, and there are so many people who can't. And uh, kind of seeing this happen in real time, seeing this transformation in real time, I thought that was very humbling uh, to see that. And and um, and I, I suppose I wanted to comment a little bit early about what some, what the uh, some of the professors and uh, what Margaret. Uh, had mentioned earlier about a lot of communication difficulties or challenges, I should say, uh, between you know, uh, being a professor or, or or being a student having to walk into a completely new environment every single semester when you're not familiar with the professor, or if you have, especially if you hadn't had that professor before, they don't know how you operate and you don't know how they operate. So, um, and I suppose you know that's also just the challenge that takes place regardless of whether you're working with with someone with a disability or not but um 
coming from the, uh, back, my background is, you know, someone who has supported college students within social developmental disabilities uh, pretty closely, uh, supporting them through a college experience, through college courses and whatnot. And something that I, I suppose in a way I take for granted being from that area is that we see these students almost five days a week and we get to see how they work out inside of class, outside of class, somewhat in their personal lives. And, and we have a lot of practice and, and the students have and vice versa, uh, also have a lot of practice working with us as well. And, and that experience and that time spent uh, that certainly can't be taken for granted as well. So, um, so when you, you know, you've, when you know, Professor Mint and Professor Thompson have expressed today, uh, today about you know, trying to adjust or to understand or seek some kind of understanding from each of the new students who come into their uh, uh, classes, it gives me, it lends me a, a different perspective or a new a set of appreciation for just how challenging that can potentially be. And, and also, of course, uh, how challenging it can be for a student who has to walk into this completely new environment, having to figure out if a professor is going to be able to understand or understand that, as understand them or not, and their, and their unique needs. So, so I appreciated you know hearing all this today. Yeah, I just wanted for, to uh, yeah. to note that there are a few questions in the chat about how the Melissa Riggio program actually works. So, could you give us a, a quick summary, Kansaku, of of what the program uh, does? You know, what classes students can take? You know, what right. their day to day is like? Um, yeah, sure. Um, it's good being one second program director. I mean, well, I, I'll see. It. So even though I can, as program director in the Brooklyn and the Broth College programs, I'm sure you can explain much of that. But let me just ask a quick question. If there was a student like me, of course, who's currently struggling with the college life, life are there any options or he just had to stick with it? Um, I... I will definitely get to the question from the chat. i uh, love to talk about the program and explain just yeah. a little bit more where we are. No, and, no, no, you're not the answer right away. It was just a question just asking because, you know, I'm currently in the college program mm -hmm. now. So if there is, I don't, want the, I don't want there to be any student who are going through I do not enjoying the college program much. Just saying. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to address, you know, what Michael is saying as well in, in that, as I, as I mentioned, uh, talk about the program a little bit. So. Uh, our program is an inclusive higher education program for you know, young adults with intellectual developmental disabilities. And uh, we are, I mentioned in my introduction that uh, we work with, uh, uh, I work for AHRC in New York City, uh, which is a nonprofit organization who serves uh, a variety of different people throughout the boroughs uh, who, uh, who, have, who live with disabilities and in a variety of different settings, but we partnered with the colleges to allow students an opportunity, people with an opportunity who especially who would not normally be able to apply for a college and get in and experience college and reap the benefits of what college can can offer, uh, an, an opportunity to, to do this. And so we have a team of, of staff, or we call them mentors, um, who support students uh, in our program to uh, through college life, whether it be attending classes, uh, with them, uh, helping students study, prepare for exams, prefer, uh, prepare assignments uh, outside of the classroom, and then even outside of the academics, uh, we support students through college life, uh, encouraging students to attend the events, uh, clubs on campus, um, and then even outside of the campus, we encourage and support the students in the program to, uh, in, in civic engagement, whether it be volunteering at a, a particular area, interning um, in, in an area that, in a field that they're interested in. So we try to take kind of the whole college experience and and, and, and bring it together in this one program. Um, and to Michael's point about you know, his uncertainty about the, you know, his, his struggles in, in the, uh, in, in the co college courses or and whatnot. Now, I remember when Michael first came in to our program, uh, you know, Michael was very uncertain that he would be ever a fit for this program or, or would have any chance of succeeding in this program uh, whatsoever. Uh, you know, seeing, and, and that is a sentiment that is shared, I think, by a lot of students in general, but probably especially 
students who come into our program who typically would not have access to college in the first place. Um, that why do I even belong here? Uh, do I have any shot at at learning anything, gaining anything from this experience when uh, that when high school was already a struggle for me? And um, and we get that sentiment a lot. And so f at least for the first couple semesters, Michael, I think. Uh, and Michael and, and like so many other students in the program uh, had a lot of doubts about whether uh, they would do be able to learn anything or gain anything from our program. And um, a lot of the the, the so-called success that we that that is measured in the program is has very little to do with the grades. I would say um, uh, it grades that our students earn in the classes, and has more to do with. Uh, how much they can take away from from the learning objectives that the professors have uh, have brought uh, are bringing forward in their classes and outside of even outside of classes, how much can a student in the program take advantage of what the resources that KCC offers or the kind of the um, the events and, and everything else that the campus has to offer, and that would be perhaps a, def a different definition of success that we might have. So when so you know when when someone like Michael uh, is you know, is struggling with their schedule or or you know going through a difficult time with the academics, I always encourage you know students in program like Michael that that this struggle is in a way inherently part of the college experience, but it, without being dismissive of that struggle, it is a challenging time for so many people um, and. And it's also a huge learning opportunity and learning experience. And we definitely want to, you know, try to parse away at what is the valuable learning experience and also seeing how we can overcome these challenges at the same time together and, and, and making sure that there's value in that challenge. So, and that, and I know I've rambled, I've rambled a little bit now, so I will, I will be quiet, but thanks for the opportunity. No, thanks, Kenzoku. And I think, as Peter said earlier, this applies to everybody. And, um, you know, for students, you know, I think uh, have courage, reach out to your professor or an advisor or the counseling or accessibility or a peer, just anybody you can reach out to to talk about how to how to make your um, time at Kingsborough more enjoyable and uh, I think enjoyment and fun is is not very often talked about in education or not enough and uh, so I encourage you to do that. Um, speaking of fun that was my last question of folks. <laughs> um, before that I'm going to indulge and and have my chance to, to um, yeah, it was just about to ask. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share screen now and hopefully I'm going to show a YouTube clip that Michael made in my EDC 3000 class. Students were asked to make a book for children and write lyrics to the melody of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It was an integrated curriculum project and um, I just show Michael's uh, video often to students who are now doing this project. We're, so we're um, seeing your email right now. So, oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So do you see Michael now? Yes. Great. I, Michael Lettman, would like to share something with all of you, and even children. It's this book that I've made. It has the lyrics of a song that I made up myself. And it's sung to the tune of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, which as we all know, is a very famous song in children's music. The title of this book is also the same title of my song. Brush Your Teeth. I would like to sing you my song as I read the lyrics from my own book. Young little children, brush your teeth. 
You can make them nice and clean. You'll make sure they're not dirty. Your teeth will be so happy. Young little children, brush your teeth nice and clean for you and me. The end. I hope my song can be enjoyed for many children as they brush their teeth in the day and in the night, as I would like to see them in great big smiles with their excellent clean teeth. <laughs>
<clears throat> I have a lot of fun stories. I mean, the it's, it's a real privilege to be able to teach what I really love, which is photography, and share the joy that I find in it. And um, gosh, I mean, photo club is one of the times when we just make things and that's fun you know there's no grading on you know or sort of pressure to to do something that you know meets a certain you know goal preset you know it's 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 much more exploratory and we came upon um one of the fun things that we did recently is we have some button making machines and we we're cutting out circles of um from magazines to make the buttons and then we realized that you could hold these pages with the circles cut out um, up to people and take their picture through these circles. And that was something the students uh, wow. in the program discovered, and you know, we we went off and started making projects out of that. So that's one example. That sounds fun. Sounds very fun. And for, can faculty come to the photography club? Absolutely. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Tuesdays at have, two. Have camera. We'll come. Alumni allowed. Oh, you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Margo. Okay. Um, I've had a, a lot of uh, fun uh, things at, at Kingsborough. It's hard to choose uh, just one. Um, I would say that in the end of it, uh, you know, that um, public speaking thing I, I did with uh, Thompson and actually ended up being a lot of fun. Of course, the diversity festival was probably uh, one of the most fun times that I'd had. And another fun thing that I really love is uh, working with the uh, student club Students Unlimited who are going to do a panel tomorrow. And uh, one of the fun things that always happens is, you know, I would like when I would become friends with professors, I would bring them in uh, to the club events and they kind of got to know me and my friend group like that and kind of be part of that. So that that was a lot of fun for me, just kind of spreading the message of the club and having the professors get in on it because like, if they were students. And of course they took the food. <laughs> That's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun, huh? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, okay, um, Michael, Michael and Kensaku, uh, fun moments. Okay. Oh, I had a fun moment during the. Oh, we lost you there, Michael. The sound is off. Michael. The sound's gone. Although you're not muted. Ah, that's weird. That is weird. I'm sorry, Michael. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Your volume just went. Huh. Now you. Sorry, can, can anyone hear me? You're no, back. You're back. Can you? Now we can hear you. Now we can you're hear. Back. Sorry, internet problems. Okay, let me quickly say this. I was gonna say, well, you said fun times, right, Professor Carpenter? Yep. <laughs> well, some of you may not be aware of this, but I'm sure Program Director Kansaku is aware of what our program does during the winter and summer semesters, back when we had the in-person freedom that we all enjoyed. <sighs> okay. So during those two semesters, other than we have having our own classes with the mentors, we have to continue learning, of course. We, uh, we, do enjoy, we do enjoy some activities together, especially going out to the community and enjoying ourselves. I mean, I hardly ever do that right now, even though they wish to continue doing that. Kansaku, please take care of the rest. I'm sure you're putting out fires a lot, Kensaku, but how about some fun? fun oh, moments? no, no, trust me. The, the fires just or is something that just happens and does, doesn't, you know, yes, it takes up time, but it's not nearly the you know the you know doesn't represent the experience whatsoever uh no mike to what michael just is, uh, mentioned about some of the things that we do maybe on our off time that has nothing to do with the college courses that we do uh sometimes we need to stretch our legs and just have a good time um especially in, in the in between semesters that we call them um i I'm not sure. Uh, you know, over the over the winter, we had a couple of uh, holiday parties, um, which was actually our first one of our literally our first foray back into really seeing everyone in person for the first time, which might seem a little strange, but it took us a lot to get to that point where where the majority of the students felt comfortable to get together uh, and see each other at a, at a party and kind of seeing each other for the first time since the pandemic. That was really fun and um 
and we had a series of different activities to get everyone you know, comfortable with each other again. And, you know, I, I just know that I, I was just uh, more recently, there was maybe there was like a bowling event that we did. And, and uh, I just remember getting absolutely destroyed by the students who, who clearly had a lot more experience than I, I, do, I do at bowling. But um, kind of just being able to see the other side of the students that has nothing to do with academics. And frankly speaking, like we're, we're, yes, we're at KCC and yes, it's an academic setting, but um, I'm always appreciative and, and, and enjoy seeing what students um, are engaged with and involved with outside of academics, their hobbies, uh, and you know, like taking away anything about them being a student or, or even having a disability. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, the, the, some of the hobbies that the students in the program have are just are in line with mine and, and just having a blast talking about, you know, random things like video games or, uh, I don't know, back in the day, like Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I don't know if people recognize that as a thing. Um, things, things, niche things that a lot of people maybe not, not, maybe not, might not recognize, but I definitely appreciate that we're able to have this type of connection. It's always a fun time. So it always, it's always, I'm always appreciative of that. And I remember some of the uh, Melissa Riggio students coming back, alum, and they came and talked to the faculty interest group that Jeremy Sawyer and I run. And it was just so fun to see them and, and take silly photographs with them and just wonderful to see them, you know, some of them having work, some of, just some of them having not seen each other for ages. And it was just, just a really wonderful moment. Um, I, I really cherish those photos that we took. Um, uh, Peter, you, you get to say what's fun too. I was hoping I'd get the chance. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I have the privilege, as Margot said, of, of being the, uh, the faculty advisor for the Students Unlimited Club. And the most fun we ever have is just when we're having like conversations and we're talking about like everyday life and, and the oddities that one experiences out in the world. Um, we've had a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, we've also like hosted these events where we, we've done uh, game shows and, and things like that, where, you know, we, we still talk about that competition to this day. Um, people still are exercising their bragging rights. <laughs> and uh, we just have had a good time together. And I think uh, that's one of the, the things that I enjoy the most about about my work at Kingsborough is just the, the life and the energy that the students bring um, and the fun that we have just, just in conversation um, and activities as well, but um, definitely we've had some great conversations and that's what the, that's how the panel from tomorrow arose um, in that we were having such a great conversation. We realized that it'd be great for other people to be a part of it. So I hope that folks can make it tomorrow at four o'clock uh, to be a part of our combo. Great, thank you. Yeah, so um, for everybody, I guess it's a good uh, a good thing to do once in a while when you're feeling frustrated and challenged and so on to remember to remember fun times and good times uh, during your your college experience, whether faculty or students. Well, um, we've run over time, and I uh, want to thank Professor Thompson, Professor Mintz, Tensaku, Margot, Michael and Peter, especially for um, hosting this event. Um, I hope people have found this interesting. I've certainly learned things and reminded myself of the fun times. And um, I don't know if anybody else would like to say a final word and including uh, anybody who's, in, who's not on the panel. Um, one final piece of advice that I want to give to um, Kingsborough students that are having difficulties with their classes, because I discovered this when I became an alumni, as soon as I had graduated, I missed the frustration because I missed the school. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I really did. 
I was like, I, I, I miss freaking out about the finals. I miss freaking out about the group projects because like, you know, it was something to look forward to every day, like the, the hard stuff, the good stuff, the friendships that would come out of uh, the good stuff or the hard stuff. I really uh, miss that. And I will have that again. But, uh, you know, it's different when it's not Kingsborough. Kingsborough is the first, so I hold it to a very high standard. <laughs> Great. And th thanks, Anna, for that comment. Anybody I also wanted else? To, yeah. Well, I wanted to thank you, Sue, for for putting in so much effort this for this week and and spearheading a lot of the events that we're having, um, and of course the panelists for for your contributions. Um, it's nice to hear that that other people are having a a similar experience to, that that I'm having. You know, with engaging with the students and just having a good time and and really getting to know them as 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 people as we should. Um, so, uh, Disability Awareness Week is going to continue. We have three events scheduled for tomorrow and then another two events for Thursday. Um, I've posted the link for the next event in the chat and that's gonna be uh, Faith Fogelman who uh, works very closely with our office through the uh, TRIO program. Um, she's gonna be talking about identity um, and that, that should be a, a great talk tomorrow at 11.30. Um, if you're interested, you can click the link in the chat and that will take you straight to the registration. Um, there's another link that, that shows you the entire agenda where you can see the three events for tomorrow and the two for Thursday. And, you know, I hope to see many of you at some more of our events. Um, they've, they've been going great so far, a lot of interaction, a lot of learning happening, and, you know, most of all connection and, and you know, people coming together, which is important. Um, I think one thing that Michael highlighted for us today is that you know, us socializing and getting together and, and, and sharing our experiences is, is an important part of us being in this community together. So I hope that we can continue to do that. And uh, so yeah. thank you everyone for coming and participating yeah. and sharing yourselves. Thank you, everybody. Take you care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.